Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fritz Kuhnlins, and welcome back for another installment of our alumni webinar series. Our alumni webinar series is dedicated to helping alumni tackle the challenges of finding success in music and the arts. Everything from budgeting to moving across the country to better understanding new technologies in our daily and pre-professional and professional routines. We hope that this series gives you tools, tips, new perspectives on how to approach the ever-increasing fast-paced world. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to review today's format and ground rules for the discussion. This webinar is sponsored by the Berkeley Office of Alumni Affairs. The Office of Alumni Affairs is dedicated to building and connecting the vast communities of college and conservatory alumni worldwide. Every year, we hold over 100 in-person events from LA to New York City to London to Tokyo, designed to connect alumni from across the music universe and the arts. Be sure to check out our website for alumni news, stories, and event updates from around the community. Today's webinar falls on an extra special day, as today is Grammy Nominations Day. I want to take a moment to recognize this year's nominees. Congratulations on all your hard work, and we look forward to celebrating with you at the Grammys in January. Today's webinar is meant to provide tips, tricks, and advice for alumni from the college and conservatory communities. The format will be 45 minutes discussion, followed by 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A. Our Q&A is curated by our Berkeley alumni staff. So for those of you who are new to our webinar series, please use the chat feature, which is located in the GoToWebinar control panel at the bottom of the control panel. Um, to deliver your questions. We will then queue your questions during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Please note that our presenters consist of faculty, staff, alumni, and friends of Berkeley in the industry. The views and opinions expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect Berkeley's policies or position. Today's topic is all about web presence and how do we go about building a digital showroom for our art that is engaging, dynamic, and an accurate showing of what we're trying to share. I think today's webinar covers one of our more tougher topics. It's visuals, it's marketing, there's a lot going on behind the curtain. Web presence today is one part social, one part visual, um, but also one part what I would call stealth data ninja, all of which is not wholly related to your art. Today our presenters will speak about what makes websites pop from both the user and the artist musicians who use them and need them. They will also discuss how to make your website dynamic for 2019 with a robust set of tools that work in tandem with social media. With that, I would like to welcome Sienna Oristaglio and Noah Blumenson Cook to the webinar. Sienna is an artist, an educator, and an entrepreneur. Noah, an artist as well, has also worked significantly in technology and media production. Together, they bring over 25 years of experience in what I like to call the ATM, the art, tech, and media environment, helping to successfully create, launch, and go viral dozens of TV, media, education, and nonprofit campaigns. Together, they represent Void Academy, a New York-based education community and research portal designed to connect and educate artists with tools and resources to be successful in their business. With that, I will pass the mic and the presentation over to Sienna and Noah. Welcome, you two. Hi, Fritz. Thank you for that introduction. That was the best introduction I think we've ever had. I'm, <laughs> I'm such a huge fan. Thank you. That was wonderful. So as Fritz said, we're I'm Sienna. This is Noah. And we're the Void Academy. There we go. Um, so basically, together, we have um, helped artists of all different stripes create amazing crowdfunding campaigns, uh, create mailing lists build wonderful websites. Um, we've helped artists raise uh, over the past five years nearly $2 million from crowdfunding campaigns and various other forms of um, fundraising. Um, and we really created the Void Academy. We created this organization because we found that very good practical information in, in what Fritz called the ATM is very difficult to find. Um, and we, we, we had experience in the area, so we wanted to provide that to artists of all stripes. Yeah, basically what we found, yeah, I love that term Fritz, by the way, we're totally stealing it if that's okay. Uh, <laughs> so we found that art doesn't work like normal products, basically. Um, there's a lot of information on the internet about how to sell things, how to be an entrepreneur, how to be a business person in the world. And uh, what we found is that a lot of those calls to action, a lot of those motivations just don't really work for art or music uh, because they require a different set of priorities, sometimes a different set of skills, uh, and definitely different mentality. I mean, so 
<laughs> what we found is that artists don't make work because they uh, because they want to make money. They make work because they need to, because that's what's in their hearts. It's what they need to communicate to the world. So uh, similarly, I mean, buyers don't really buy art because it's solving simple problems in their lives. It's they're 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 spending money and time on experiencing art because it's beautiful. It's transcendent. It's something that they uh, that enriches their lives. And so. Yeah, people don't comparison shop for art. It's uh, the whole thing is a different approach. So we tend to uh, want to help artists kind of become their own managers uh, in a certain sense, um, really around that concept, really to um, be able to manage yourself around that that idea of providing beauty to the world, perhaps uh, uh, as a major motivator instead of just focusing entirely on the money. And what we find is that act, that act, that actually tends to work better. Um, especially when you start to hire a team, when you actually kind of know how to do the management side of things, everything starts to make sense uh, in a way that it hadn't previously. Yeah, that's so true. And so what we do is support artists in finding ways for them to engage with their communities um, and grow their communities, grow their audiences. Um, we kind of take a nonprofit fundraising approach um, and we, we've we built, a, basically our organization consists of an online curriculum and um, office hours, consulting um, and workshops and webinars like what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. So with that said, um, today we're going to be talking about how to create a really amazing web presence for your music. Um, so I'd love to test out this little chat feature here. I hope that everyone can see the chat feature um, in their control panels. And I just want to, um, er everyone who's in here, um, I'd love to know where you're tuning in from um, and uh, basically whether you have a website um, or not. So if you can test out that chat feature, um, it should be in the control panel. You just type in there um, and you just let us know where you're tuning in from and if you have a website and if so, what platform your website is on. Uh, we got Austin, Texas, we have Tampa, Florida, we have California, Washington. Wow, okay, we got a lot of people from all around the world right now, which Nashville, is so wonderful. Seattle, California, nope. Italy, holy crap. And we have a lot of people who ha who do have websites, a few who don't have websites. Okay, so we'll be using this chat feature just to talk with you throughout the, the presentation. Um, and I think right now what we're gonna do is dive right in. Yeah, um, let's do it. And please feel free to, um, you know, post questions along the way. We'll we'll save the questions mostly till the end. We have we'll have a Q and A section, um, and uh, and and we'll go from there. We'll 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 save questions to, you know, as Fred said, um, that the alum the the, the staff uh, will curate. Great. Okay, so let's let's dive into web presence for musicians. Okay. So uh, today we are going to be talking about four exciting things. Uh, we are going to be talking about going beyond the portfolio, which you'll uh, see what we mean in a minute. Uh, you're gonna be talking about the community cycle, which is a wonderful metaphor uh, that I hope you take with you from this particular presentation. Uh, we're gonna be talking about calls to action, uh, which are sometimes scary, but mostly awesome. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna be talking about platforms, not the kind that Mario jumps on, but the kind that we build a website with. Uh, and then we are going to be taking your cues and Aing them. <laughs> that, that's that's a phrase. Okay, so uh, let's talk about going beyond the portfolio. So this is the website of one Geraldine Q. Bassist. Uh, she is not a real person. She is my alter ego, um, and I think it's pretty good looking. Um, the 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 album title is clearly a bit of a pun, but um, other than that, uh, we have a really clear design. There's a bunch to explore. We've got links to all of her socials. Um, yeah, it's it, there, there's a lot to like here. Um, you know, we we really kind of like made a really good strong uh, first impression. Uh, we've got this about page, uh, which, you know, it's good to have a strong about page, right? Uh, we've got nice press. We've got nice stuff going on here. Um, yeah, and we've got a contact page where I can get in touch with Geraldine. But why would I do that? So if I were looking to book Geraldine or write an article. Uh, or do some other sort of form of pre-packaged business with Geraldine, I would already know what I wanted to do to get in contact with her, right? I would probably already have the message written in my head before I even landed on this contact page. But let's say I'm none of those things. Let's say that I showed up to Geraldine's website because I Googled her, because a friend of mine was playing her music in her car and I thought it was awesome and I asked you who that was and she's like, oh my God, that's Geraldine Q Bassist. Her new album, Making an Example, is out now. You should go to her website, right? So if I, was that person, like a, sort of a casual introduction. And I go to Geraldine's website, 
I, I, let's say I'm thrilled by the music. Let's say I'm excited by everything going on there. I still wouldn't really use that contact page. What most likely would happen is I would show up to that website and my reaction would be, that's cool. And then I would leave. Um, it's not a bad website. This website is not a failure in any sense, except that <laughs> uh, walk-ins, people who are excited to just see your music for the first time, people who maybe just been introduced to you, it's not really for them, right? So most people are taught to think of their websites as kind of extensions of their professional life, right? So uh, a kind of online business card or a white box, kind of a gallery kind of a thing. Uh, and that's a fine start. It's not bad to have a portfolio on the internet. In fact, for the first 20 years of the internet, that's frankly all we were doing with it. But it's only a start. It's only just the beginning of what is really effective to do on the web. So what we need is a call to action that leads to actual engagement with our audience. I didn't put the clap emojis in here, but you can imagine them as I'm talking this. So uh, it's this is what actually transforms people with a passing interest in your work, sorry, uh, to <laughs> actual engagement with an audience, right? So it's what transforms people. It, it's what gives people the opportunity uh, to turn a passing interest into potentially, hopefully, a passion, right? Um, the most effective websites lead to active experiences, right? They give you a clear and obvious way to engage with the artist in some way, uh, to go deeper than just browsing a bro brochure or looking at a portfolio. So before we get to work on our call to action, uh, we need to figure out what is the purpose of our website? What are we actually, what are we actually doing with our website? And if I, I would love to hear your answer first, actually. Uh, if you want to throw in chat, what is the purpose of my website? I'm going to give you an example. Um, but yeah, I want to see your answers too. Maybe we'll talk about them a little bit at the end. So for those of you who do have websites, yeah, if you'll answer in the questions section, um, what, is, what do you consider to be the, pur the purpose of your website? For those of you who do not have websites, don't worry, we're gonna talk at the end about various platforms and we'll make sure that we address you too um, and give you a place to start. Um, we see, I see some awesome see some answers, some great answers on to there. get people to like me. Yeah, 100% <laughs> raise awareness about my unique genre. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, yeah, having to uh, educate an audience is really an intense thing. Uh, yeah, show, showcase my skills. Do they match your job? Yeah, exactly. Knowing exactly that you're like, I, I, I want to get hired for a very specific thing. That's really important. To be taken seriously. That's maybe my most favorite answer of all. A thousand percent. Uh, yeah, to be known and possibly hired with a band for a gig. To, tell, to sell CDs, I see that there yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's really great too. Yep, yep, yep. To be seen as a professional. This is wonderful stuff. Awesome. Yeah. So all of this, these are all my favorite answers because uh, this is the answer that I like to start with as, as a beginning point. My website exists to give people an easy and fun way to join my community, right? And I think I can fit all of your answers into that one <laughs> phrase. Uh, this is where I like to start. Uh, and I feel like what you guys have been answering is is often where uh, 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 folks start to take that and evolve with it, right? This is really meant as a leaping off point. So if we think about it, you know, my people, my website exists to give people an easy and fun way to join my community. People join your community if they take you seriously. They join your community if they take you if you have credibility as a professional. Uh, if you uh, are known and seen as a musician with substance, right? That's what's going to uh, uh, get people to join your community. So yes, I love all of your answers. That is a thousand. Uh, oh, this is my favorite one so far. I think that having a website is just a way to say I exist, but I still don't see how the site can change the way I do things. You're right. The, ch the site itself doesn't necessarily change how you do things, but it's a matter of uh, self-expression in a sort of wholesome and a uh, 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 professional way. And you're going to see how this works in a minute. And also, even if it doesn't get, change the way that you do things as a professional, it, it does change, as we're going to talk about, the way that your community or people who are going to interact with you as a musician do things. So it does change the way that they can engage with you. And that's what's really important here. And that's sort of the, the, the purpose of, in our, in our eyes, of having a website. And that is a great segue, by yeah. the way, uh, because we are going to be talking uh, about our community cycle. Now, this is how we're gonna answer this big question. Who, who is your website for, right? Like who are we actually creating this for? Who are we talking to directly? To understand that we need to actually understand a little bit more about the motivations of our community and what brings people to our website and what they're expecting when they get there. So let's talk about the community cycle. This is my favorite thing. 
Yeah, so here we have a metaphor that Noah and I um, and our co-founder Karina came up with to talk about different segments of an artist or a musician's community. Um, and so this really works for artists of all stripes, but absolutely for, for musicians. It's a, it's a perfect example of how musicians' communities can be segmented um, into different sort of sections based on how engaged they are in the musicians' community. So basically here, it's a little uh, diagram that we uh, basically used to illustrate these different segments of the community. So at the top, we have strangers. Um, these, these are super important segment of the community. They're basically people who have the opportunity to know about your work, but don't know about your work yet. So we're gonna come back around to them at the end. You'll see that below that, we have walk-ins. So walk-ins are people who have just shown up on your website. And maybe they got there because they met you at a show and you gave them a card or a flyer, or maybe as Noah used uh, in, the, in his example, a friend uh, told them to look up your work. Maybe they found you on Facebook or Instagram or wherever your work spreads to on the internet. Um, basically, a walk-in is someone who has just shown up on your website, and when they do, and they love what they see or hear, and you give them an opportunity to do so, they might end up becoming a supporter. So a supporter is sort of the next category. It's someone who's walked in to your website and they've they've made it sort of an aesthetic match with your visual aesthetic, with, uh, with your music, and then they ultimately want to do something a little bit more to support you. And that's someone who basically really has decided that they love their work, the, the work that you do, and you know, they're likely to buy a record or maybe go to a show, or if you're running a crowdfunding campaign, they may back the campaign at a certain level. Um, so when a supporter has a good experience of actually engaging, they oftentimes, after many different sort of ways of having giving them the opportunity to engage, they can become an enthusiast. So that's the next level there. An enthusiast, you know, they're just super into your work. They're super into your, your music and you probably deserve it because you're awesome. Um, so enthusiasts really help strangers, those people at the beginning, turn into walk-ins again. So essentially, I think if we all think about ourselves in this context, I know that there are tons of musicians who I have gone from a stranger to an enthusiast about, right? So whether that's someone that a friend recommended to me and then I checked out their music and then I ultimately love their music and I, Bought a, bought, a, bought a CD or you know went up to their band camp, purchased an album, um, and then ultimately they had a mailing list that I signed up for, and then I got updates, and I went to a show, and then I really loved them, and it, it sort of get, they gave me the opportunity to engage the, with, with them in a lot of ways, and now I'm the enthusiast who's bringing in another friend who's a stranger to their work. So what we're doing with this, this, this cycle works in person, but it also works on the internet. And so what we're trying to do with our website is essentially give people reasons to to who have come to your site to move through this community cycle to be, go from a walk-in on your website to a supporter to an enthusiast um, who will ultimately bring new people over to your website and ultimately into your community okay so basically um you know how do we you know we may be left with the question here how do we move people through these tiers of the community how do we turn someone who walks into our website into a supporter and ultimately to an enthusiast of the music and so I think basically the answer to that is through what Noah mentioned earlier, it's a call to action, right? So it's ways of offering people, giving people the opportunity to engage with you further. So rather than just having a portfolio website, like what Noah showed with Geraldine Q. Basis, we're actually trying to give people who show up on your site, who may or may not be familiar with you, the opportunity to engage with you in some other way, um, to get a little bit closer to your work, to, um, you know, th there are many ways to do that. And we're going to go into that right now. But we want to basically provide a path from walk-in to supporter to enthusiast. We want to guide people uh, into your, into your uh, community. So how we do that is through calls to action. And this is a term that you may have heard um, or you may not have heard, but essentially it's kind of a brandy marketing term that's often used, but we find it really useful in this context. Um, because what it means is you're giving people the opportunity to engage with you further and you're asking them to do so. Um, so we're gonna look so we're gonna look at a couple examples of calls to action. Yeah, this one. Um, these these examples of call to actions you probably have seen, and they're really obnoxious. I'm sorry, this is probably a scary slide. <laughs> um, but we see things like this all the time, right? Find out more, buy more, buy now. Uh, you know, basically living in New York, as Noah and I both do, we see, I think the the, the statistic is 3,000 calls day. to action a day. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you do too. You see them in person, you see them online, right? And so 
you know, what these are examples of calls to action that are kind of frustrating. Um, they they don't actually, I don't know about you, but when, when I look at this page of calls to action, it, it stresses me out, it raises my blood pressure. I feel a little bit overwhelmed. I don't feel like following that call to action. I feel like uh, running away screaming. And that's by design, yeah. for that matter. Um, it's so meant to interrupt you. It's meant to interrupt, yeah. So this is what we call interruption marketing and it does have a purpose. And the reason why people use this kind of marketing is because ultimately it does activate this little part of a lizard brain response where you feel like you're gonna miss out sometimes and sometimes people will click things. Um, it, it works to some extent, but basically what we found is that it really doesn't work for artists of any kind. Um, this kind of thing, this kind of interruption marketing is not the kind of call to action that we're talking about when we talk about using them on your website or in your web presence or even on social media. So what we wanna do essentially instead is something more along these lines. Um, there's a man named Seth Godin. He wrote a really great book about permission marketing. And this is a quote from him. It's permission marketing is the privilege and not the right of delivering anticipated personal and relevant messages to people who actually want to get them. Right. And so as an artist, wh where we're going, you know, to create engagement on our website and how we do that is not in a way that feels overwhelming. It's not in a way that interrupts the, the, the visitor. It's in a way that we we acknowledge that after making an aesthetic match with our music or with our um, you know, visuals on our site, that people may actually want to engage further. They may want to support us as an artist. Mm -hmm. I know, again, I put myself in the shoes of someone who has just discovered a new musician, and when I visit their site, I'm actually looking for a way to engage with them further. Mm -hmm. I'm actually looking for a way to um, be asked and be, be told what it is that this artist um, would like me to do um, to support their work. So if we go back, um, to essentially how to do this. Um, the people who come to your site are really usually looking for you. And yeah. so we want to ask them for permission for a conversation in the right context and at the right time. So here we're back at Geraldine. She didn't listen to me. She didn't listen to Noah's advice. She didn't listen to our <laughs> advice. This is an example of how an artist, you know, we see this on some musician websites where you open the site and there's this huge pop-up that pops right up. Um, and it's uh, it's it kind of is reminiscent of that very overwhelming and scary um, buy now, uh, you know, find out more in these huge letters um, form of permission of, of not permission marketing. Mm -hmm. It's this is interruption marketing. And, you know, Geraldine, it's kind of strange that she didn't take Noah's advice because she is Noah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, basically what we see here is that um, it, it, we're, she's grabbing our attention, but there is an issue here. And I'd love to know in the chat what you think the issue is with this um, with this on an artist's site. Um, how does this make you feel when you see it, basically? Yeah. How does this make you feel? Let's say you're the first you're the first time on an artist's site, right? And this pops up. I'd love to know in the questions, you know, what do you feel when you see this? And I think, yeah, it's, it's offensive. Go away, I love it. Go away, pop-ups make me want to close them immediately. It's a gross oblig obligation. It makes me yep. feel interrupted. Everyone hates pop-ups. No thanks. Don't need more email. Not personalized. Nice. Exactly. So, you know, again, if you have one of these on your website, don't worry. It's okay. You know, that's that. You know, it's something that we would recommend changing to something more like what we're going to show you now. Oh my God, you're nailing it. So yes, it should appear a bit later once you surf on the site a little. I have no idea who she is, so I don't really want to sign up for anything yet. Exactly. You've got it. You nailed it. Exactly. So I think that's that's you. I haven't had time to resonate with the music. I haven't had time to resonate with the aesthetic before she's already asking me to do something. Um, so I feel a little bit put off by that. And again, yes, yeah, Sarah, it's spam. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to go to a better example of that. Okay. So let's say I've, you know, we, we can only show much, so show so much on the screen, but let's say, you know, we've scrolled down a little bit. We've already explored uh, Geraldine's website a little bit. We've kind of looked through her sections. We've listened to her music. Um, we've seen really cool, beautiful, high quality pictures from her shows. And now at the bottom of her page, it says this, and this is a, also a call to action, right? Let's stay in touch. That's a call for me to stay in touch with Geraldine. Um, and what we see here is sort of a natural form of permission marketing. It's not interrupting my experience, but it is saying, hey, I care about you. I know you're on the site for a reason. Um, and if you want any more engagement with me, here's what you get. And so what's great about this call to action is that it not only 
is a form of permission marketing. It not only falls in the right place when, when I'm already probably as a visitor thinking about how I might want to engage further, but it also is, is very um, informative about what happens when I engage further, right? So the call to action is sign up below and I'll send you an email once a month. So that sets an expectation of how often I can expect to hear from her. She says, I'll let you know when I'm playing near you and you'll receive a special invitation to my monthly streaming concerts. So she's setting ex an expectation of how often, what I'm gonna receive when I put my name and email in there, my precious name and email. <laughs> and she's reassuring me that I'm not gonna get spammed, right? And not only that, but there's an incentive. Um, I'll receive a special invitation to my monthly streaming, to her monthly streaming con uh, concert. That's such a wonderful thing. It makes me excited. I, if I like this musician and I think about, you know, wanting to engage further, wanting to know when she's playing a show in my area, I also am going to be excited about if there's a monthly streaming concert that I can tune into online, um, and that will give me an incentive to sign up for her mailing list. So that's a step further that could turn me from a walk-in on the website to a supporter. So. The other great thing about this call to action is that it is in the footer of her website. So this is another page of Geraldine's website and it's not only in one place, but basically wherever an aesthetic match can be made. Um, and you know, in this case, it's under a music video. So mm -hmm. let's say I watch this music video and I'm like, whoa, this was super rad, this cool forest music video where she's playing her ba bass in the woods and you know, in the snow, <laughs> amazing. Um, and then I go to the bottom and I'm like, yeah, no, I wanna see her monthly streaming concert. I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely put my email address in here. So basically, that it also shows up wherever that might be a possibility, but not in a way that is intrusive. So really, a good call to action feels optional. It follows the content. It gives the visitor time to match with the aesthetic of the artist. It's not the sole focus of the page. It makes the destination clear and sets expectations. And the best ones yet add an incentive, have something extra cool and special that that get you even more excited to sign up. So now oh, there was one thing. So yeah, uh, the one that I just wanted to reiterate the last two points here because I see them. I see beautiful, wonderful, amazing calls to action all the time that don't necessarily take those last two into account, make the destination clear and add an incentive. So making the destination clear, that's pretty, that's pretty, that's pretty obvious, like what'll happen when I actually sign up and get an email. But I did wanna talk about adding an incentive because in this case, as you can see, we've got a special invitation to my monthly streaming concerts, right? Now, this isn't something you have to do. Obviously your uh, incentive can take whatever form you want, uh, but a lot of people are sort of like, well, that seems like a lot of effort for a mailing list, right? Like that's kind of a lot to do uh, just to invite people to my mailing list. Well, here's the thing. Um, adding an incentive actually helps people with a certain kind of brain uh, 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 more than people with a certain other kind of brain. So when people are uh, looking to help an artist, right, there, there are uh, really two different kinds of motivations. Uh, and I'm actually going to uh, get big here. I'm going to, there we go. So hopefully you can see me now because I like to gesticulate wildly while I do this. Okay. So on the one hand, we have transactional people, right? If you've ever walked into a pharmacy and you're like, I need some trail mix, I'm starving, I just need some trail mix. You go into the pharmacy, you buy the trail mix, and every single step along the way, if somebody is like asking you a question or trying to sell you more things or just making that at all more difficult, you're annoyed, right? You really just want trail mix and to get out. Um, you're a transactional person in this moment, right? Like you really just want to finish that transaction, get the thing and leave. Um, a patron, someone with patronage motivation is generally speaking more, uh, uh, um, they want to help you because you are creating the kind of beauty that they want to see in the world, right? They don't actually really care that much if they receive something from you. That's not really the point. They're helping you because you are able to uh, make the world uh, an aesthetically better place uh, because they were able to help you, right? That's the motivation and that's the reward. That's the benefit they receive. So by adding a little thing, something that you get, uh, you are able to tackle not just people with patronage motivation who think what you're doing is beautiful and just want to help you based on that, but also folks who are transactional, transactionally motivated, which is frankly a lot of people. Um, and they, they they want something to happen when they do a thing. They want a tiny little bit of lizard brain reward, no matter what it is, uh, because that'll help them feel good about themselves. And frankly, that's what we're all here to do. 
And I want to say too that, so this call to action example that we're using is to sign up for a mailing list. We love mailing lists. We think that they're extremely powerful tools for musicians. Um, we've seen musicians use them um, when, when sort of thought of as an extension of the creative process and not just simply a newsletter. We've seen them you know, used really well to build communities and to grow audiences. Mm -hmm. um, that, that call to action is just an example though. And mm -hmm. there are all kinds of things when there's one main thing that you want the person to do um, that can be sign up for a mailing list, that can be buy a CD, that could be, you know, any, any call to action that um, follows those principles that we talked about works there. Um, we just find that on websites, um, we really like to see people have a mailing list call to action because that's a way of not losing those people who have come to your site as a walk-in, become a supporter because they've sort of made an aesthetic match with you. And then you'll never know that they were there if they never put their email address in. So we like this as a call to action. So I want to ask one more question, which is, you know, how many people in this webinar right now have a mailing list? And if you do, do you have a call to action for it on your website? So if you can answer in the chat, um, let us know if you do have a mailing list, let us know, um, you know if it's on your website and if you want, you can share what platform you use for, for your mailing list as well. Great. And now we're gonna talk about um, a little bit about platforms that we love um, and that you know basically weighing the pros and cons about various platforms for web presence and for websites for musicians. Yes. Oh, and real quick, uh, Shouty, I loved your question, by the way. So uh, is something like be the first to hear a new music adequate incentive? Yes and no. I mean, it's very helpful. It's great. But it is, on the other hand, not really a unique um, uh, um, thing that you are adding to the mailing list, right? So. Uh, it's that's kind of a natural expectation if you join a mailing list or even social media that you're going to be the first to find out about stuff. Focus in that case, I think, on what's exclusive about mailing list membership as opposed to social media or other things that you could do, right? Yeah, so. I think adding something a little punchier to the, you know, to the mailing list sign up. I had I've worked with a musician who um, just had some, you know, a little PDF with behind the scenes, um, you know, photographs from shows. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it could be anything. Just feels a little bit special to people who sign up for the mailing list rather than the general expectation, which is that you'll get sort of updates and news. Cool. All right. Cool. Thanks for asking also, uh, answering everyone about the mailing list. We see a lot of people who have mailing lists, some people who have one but don't have a call to action on their website, a lot of people using MailChimp, which is great. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So Anyways. let's talk about platforms, not the kind that Mario jumps on. <laughs> I've got to stop making that joke. It's really, <laughs> it's really getting old. Okay. So uh, <laughs> Squarespace. Uh, so, okay, also, full disclosure, uh, uh, none of the platforms here are sponsoring us to talk about any of these things. This is simply our uh, experience with actually working on these things. Uh, okay, Squarespace, uh, easy to get up and running, it's hard to make it look bad, and the support is frankly great. I said good here, I meant great, it's really great. Um, Squarespace is, of the three options we're gonna talk about, the easiest one to use. If you are brand new to this whole thing, you do not know from coding, you do not know from web design, you do not know from anything, uh, Squarespace is probably the best starting point. Uh, it is not the least expensive starting point, uh, but it is, I think, the simplest and most obvious starting point. The reason being, uh, because it does not let you make bad things. Uh, almost nothing that you do in Squarespace, uh, unless you really try and go crazy, uh, y unless you really, really go, uh, you know, uh, you, you're really trying to get out of the out of the um, the norm. Uh, Squarespace just doesn't make you like make anything ugly. <laughs> now, the downside of that is that it's it's restrictive necessarily as a result of that, right? So it's a little bit of a walled garden. If you've ever used an Apple product uh, or even like something on the Google Play Store, you know what I mean. Uh, you can't just make any application work with Squarespace. It's not going to have third party integrations to every system out there. Uh, so if Squarespace doesn't have a feature that you need right now or that you know you're gonna need in the next few weeks of building your actual website, uh, it's probably not the right thing for you because it's not like you can extend it further. There aren't plugins, there aren't really third party integrations that aren't part of Squarespace itself. Uh, it's a little more expensive than our other options, but not really by much, especially compared to Wix. I think they're, they're well, they're, often in a price battle, so. Uh, and the final the final thing really in the con list is that it can be inflexible, which should be fairly obvious considering it's also the easiest use and most restrictive. So let's talk about Wix. Wix is our middle child. Wix is, Squarespace is for building a website. It does have an integrated mailing list uh, uh, as well, but we're mostly talking about website building platforms here. Thank you so much for the question, David. So Wix, flexible layout options. 
way more so than Squarespace. You can put things on the page wherever you want uh, in a way that Squarespace literally does not allow you to do. Uh, it's very easy to customize, and I'm, imp I'm especially impressed with the mailing list feature that is built into Wix. I think it's actually fairly priced, uh, and if you have a Wix page, Unlike every other platform where I recommend using MailChimp or uh, MailerLite or some other third-party mailing list software, I think Wix uh, can do it itself, at least until you get up to about 5,000 subscribers, which is a really great feature. Um, flexible layout options is also in the cons list. So since you can put everything everywhere, uh, you can put everything everywhere. And unless you're really paying attention to the totality of your design and actually have kind of an aesthetic in mind and a little bit of design experience, Wix can kind of get you in trouble similar to just drawing on a page, right? Like if you don't know what you don't know, yeah, uh, making a website for the first time can be a little bit tough, whereas Squarespace really uh, forcibly guides you into good design decisions. Um, Another kind of design consistency. What I found, especially working with Wix, there are a ton of different plugins and things you can do. And so here's an example. In Squarespace, if you choose a theme and you grab a mailing list signup form and you slap it onto that page, that is going to inherit the fonts and styles of your theme. So almost any element that you grab from this, the list of Squarespace elements you can put on a page, they're going to make sense when you drop them and land them on the page. Whereas Wix, and similarly WordPress some of the time, uh, if you grab that default uh, uh, um, widget, let's say, and slap it on the page, you're going to have to spend another five, 10 minutes making sure the font works, making sure the, uh, uh, um, you know, everything is actually consistent, that it's working with the fonts that you've chosen, uh, et cetera. It doesn't just automatically show up and look beautiful. There's a little bit more work to do. Uh, and then finally in the con list, and this is kind of a pro and con, uh, is the app ecosystem. Uh, it's a pro because there are apps uh, that third parties can write for Wix. Uh, there are also a ton of apps that Wix writes for themselves, uh, for their own platform. Um, the reason it's also in the con list is that unlike Squarespace, uh, it has, uh, it's almost kind of a little bit experimental. So the apps that you can install in Wix Frankly, not all of them work. <laughs> the ones that work, work great. And I've been hugely impressed with the ones that Wix wrote themselves that are common, that people use a lot, because they clearly put a lot of effort into making those great. But there are hundreds of apps on those lists, and not all of them are wonderful. This is something that uh, it has in common with our next choice, uh, which is WordPress. So this is our, our last on the list. It is cheap. It is so cheap. And the reason it's cheap is because it's free, right? So uh, <laughs> that sounds weird. It's cheap because what you're paying for is not the software. You're not paying for WordPress. You are paying for a place on the web, uh, place on the internet to host your Word, WordPress site, right? So all you're paying for is just a little chunk of computer somewhere in the cloud. And for that reason, if you go to something like Bluehost or what was the other one I recommend, SiteGrounds, yeah. uh, you can uh, get WordPress hosting for like $4 a month. That's actually reliable, which is crazy. Uh, so if you are hurting a little bit, uh, that's a really good option. Tons of plugins, tons of flexibility. Uh, WordPress is, of everything, vast, vastly more flexible than the other two options that we're talking about. And that, of course, is also the downside, as you can see from the cons list. Setup is a bit of a chore. The plugins are even sketchier than Wix because they're all third party. There is no WordPress sort of core company. Uh, 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 well, there is, it's called Automatic, but they don't make most of the plugins. Most of the plugins are made by completely other people. Uh, and that can sometimes create an issue when plugins don't work together, right? So now you have one plugin author that you have to deal with and another plugin author over here, and then the WordPress core. If it's not all working together, you've got a lot of different support things that you kind of have to pull together, and it can be sketchy. And if a lot of those words didn't make sense to you, that means that you probably shouldn't be using WordPress. You should probably go to something like Squarespace. Even like, I think a, a, some of the artists that we work with don't even know what a plugin is. And yeah. I think if you don't know what a plugin is, that's Squarespace or Wix is probably a better a better choice for you. Absolutely. Um, WordPress is really more advanced. It's for folks who um, have some experience with web design and and with you know understanding you know the, the back end of this kind of stuff. Yep. There are ways to make it beginner friendly, and so don't be intimidated by it. In fact, if you work with us, we we have all sorts of tricks we can show you in that regard. Uh, but yeah, as a as first a choice, point, yeah, yeah, as a starting point, especially if you don't if you're not like working with someone who knows how to help you through it, yeah, bit of a dicey thing. So here is our beautiful metaphor. Uh, for this ridiculous situation. So WordPress is a Swiss army knife, right? Uh, it, it it has a corkscrew, it has an awl. You can punch a hole in your belt. You can open a can really, really slowly. Uh, you can uh, open a bottle of wine if you like put it between your legs and yank for like half an hour. It's, it, look, it works, 
it's great. It'll do a lot of things, but it's not going to be the best at any of them, right? Yeah. Squarespace is a beautiful golden spork. You can only ever spoon and fork with it, right? You can only ever eat what you can eat with a spork. Uh, but it is the finest sporking experience you can possibly have. It is gleaming and golden and perfect and polished to within an inch of its life. Okay, now Wix, we don't have this pictured and Sienna is working on this illustration, so please bear with us. But Wix is a Swiss army spork, right? It's right in the middle. It is both uh, uh, It is both easy to use. The basic functions are actually pretty simple to do, uh, but it also has a lot of that Swiss Army knife to it. So, you know, if you want to dig in and you can get and get complex with it, you can, sometimes to your own detriment. So, thus our platforms. Uh, and with that <laughs> insane metaphor, uh, we're going to be moving into our Q's and A's. Uh, and I just wanted to wrap up uh, by telling you what we learned today. We talked about walk-in supporters and enthusiasts. I put this first because, frankly, it's my favorite thing uh, 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 that we talk about. And I hope that this gives you some concept of how communities form and how best to address them. We talked about calls to action, which is the the mechanism by which we actually get people excited and on our lists and into our lives and our communities. And when, then we talked about how to pick a platform. Uh, I hope that was relevant and helpful to you. And if you have more questions, post them. Uh, and Madison, thank you so much for posing that. Yeah, so Madison, we'll, get, we'll definitely get to the question. Um, anyone who has questions about what we've talked about so far, um, feel free to post them now. And um, the, the, lovely, the lovely folks at Berkeley will start um, sort of curating those questions. Um, I figure while people are thinking of their questions, um, we had a couple people send in websites in advance, a couple people in the Berkeley uh, alum community um, that we were going to go through and just show how we would offer a critique or ways to improve the website. Um, and so but just before we get to the question, we're going to just show these two websites. We're going to go through and say, here's what they could do better. And then we're going to talk just for a moment about um, what we offer as the Void Academy in terms of further ways to engage with us. And then we will answer all the questions that are coming in, um, as many as we can during this time. Um, and then Fritz will pass along our email addresses for any people whose questions we don't get to. And we're happy to communicate with you outside of the webinar context. So. I'd love to get I'd love to get started. Yeah, we're seeing some wonderful questions coming in. Don't be shy. Ask the questions, and the 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 lovely Berkeley staff will um, help us to curate them down. Um, we're going to take a look real quick at these two websites and just talk about how they could potentially be improved. Um, these were two that were sent again in advance from Berkeley alum, um, and uh, we already looked at them a little bit and have some thoughts on how to improve them. So let's start with. Hot picking? Hot picking, yeah, let's go there. All right, so this, yeah, okay. So this is, first of all, first of all, beautifully put together. Actually, really, really impressive looking website. Uh, let me just grab our audience view. Yes, we can see what we're talking about, great. Okay, so we have, uh, we have our, Lovely men on the uh, <laughs> cover of our site. Clearly, wonderful very good high, at yeah, high yeah. quality photo here. The photography is really impressive right off the bat. We have uh, a testimonial right off the bat. Uh, we have watch our videos, meet the band, book your event. Great. So Let's scroll to the bottom and see what yep, that last some more call reviews, to action is. Another wonderful photo. A whole lot of uh, socials uh, and keep up with hot pick and email address sign up. Okay, so just based on this front page, uh, there are a couple of things I'll say. This is great stuff. Uh, uh, you have a whole bunch of extremely cool stuff on your website. Uh, the f really the the first problem that I'm seeing is that uh, there are so many options to do so many things that we have kind of the opposite problem that sometimes we see. So for example, I want to know what you want me to do based on what I'm interested in, right? And we've got a sense of that here. Watch our videos, meet the band, book your event. Great. That's, that's great. So if these are our priorities, then now I'm starting to get a little confused by all this, right? So I've got a, so many menu options here. I've got about the band, I've got photos, I've got reviews, I've got news, I've got shows, I've got videos, I've got an EP, I've got corporate events, Wait, right? I would almost suggest condensing this whole thing into almost two sections. One, hire us, right? Book us. This is what we're, this, like, we're professional musicians. We can draw this much. Uh, here are testimonials. Uh, uh, you know, you won't go wrong, which is obviously true here uh, because you clearly know what you're doing. You have all, all of this mapped out in your head. Um, a simple menu of like, how do you book us, right? Like what kind of event you're planning? You've got that going on, but <laughs> watch our videos, meet the band. What I would love to see is what if I just went to your show, right? What if I actually just went to your show and I actually thought you were awesome and I just want to follow your music. 
I'm not sure that, that that's what this email address signup form is for or not. I'm not sure what uh, social media uh, you would like uh, me to follow, right? Because I've got literally every option available here and I've got this uh, Vans and Town tracker. This is all great stuff, but I've got to be guided a little bit more specifically as to what, uh, what, like what CTA you want me to take, uh, you know, knowing that I am really just a walk in here, uh, and you know, how you're going to engage me from there. Does yeah. that make sense? I think I agree exactly with Noah on these points. You know, I think that we have just a little bit of a call to action overload. And I think mm -hmm. just a little bit more simplification of what you actually want us to do. If, you know, if I'm here to book, I want to be able to do that in one simple place. And if I'm here because I was in your audience or I found out about you somewhere, um, I'd love to be able to be guided to sign up for your mailing list with a little bit more of a detailed call to action like we talked about with Geraldine. I don't, you know, I want to know what's going to happen when I sign up and maybe give me a little bit more of an incentive um, rather than just presenting all of the options because I don't really know exactly what it is what, that, that you want me to do as a band. Yeah, but that's um, but this is so this good. Is beautiful. Yeah. yeah, it's actually so well designed and laid out. Uh, yeah, we just yeah, it's 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 awesome. Cool. Uh, okay, so sometimes less is more is the is the, is the summary of that one. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about we got one more uh, today before we move on to the questions. We have Michael. So Michael is a guitar singer and writer and arranger. And here actually, I like this a lot. So we've got kind of what I was talking about before. We've got watch and book, right? So we've got an idea of like, oh, this is what you do if you just want to check them out, and this is what you do if you're a professional. So now we're getting a little bit more specific here. But we have kind of the opposite problem. Now we're actually, I think our front page is a little bit too simplified because we kind of have to get really specific about what we want before we start exploring the site. Yeah. What I would love to see is something a little bit more about, so first of all, when I start exploring your about stuff, right? If I go into guitarist, say I go into vocalist, I start to get these wonderful stories. And this is great. Uh, I love these stories. I love that you're all about vocal harmonies. I love how you're talking about actually what inspires and brings you to the work. Uh, that's something I, I always want to read. Uh, as a fan, as a walk-in, whatever I am, even if I'm trying to book you, I want to know where your passion lies because I want to know if our passions are aligned, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have a lot of cool stuff going on. You're very clear about the aspects of your uh, professional life, which is great. Again, I'm a little concerned that we're, um, that we're kind of, uh, um, what's the term I'm looking for? We're sharing um, like your different disciplines, right? We've got guitarist, vocalist, writer, arranger. But uh, what I'd like to do is try and think a little bit more from the perspective of who's coming to your page, right? Mm -hmm. So that, you know, you think of yourself as a guitarist and a vocalist and a writer, and these are separate things to you. But what about people who are hiring you? Do they necessarily see them as separate things? What can you actually do to integrate those things for the people that you're that you're that are booking you. What do they tend to book you for? Do they book you for these three separate things, or are you booked for bands, or are you booked for less? Like, I need to know a little bit more, and I need to feel a little bit more. I, I think comprehensive about um, really the 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 thrust and motivation of your own musical uh, uh, stuff, right? Yeah, so I might recommend for Michael, maybe a, rather than all of these menu options, a longer scroll yes. page that tells more of a story um, and then ultimately has these two call to actions at the bottom. Mm -hmm. I also don't see anything for people who are fans necessarily to stay in touch. Right, right. Um, and I would love to see a call to action for a mailing list. Um, if I'm someone who's found Michael, um, if I found you from you know a show or from a friend, um, I'd love to be able to sign up for a mailing list and get updates as well. Um, so I think, yeah, a long scroll with more of a narrative um, sort of uh, integrating these aspects of what you do. Um, and then, yes, I would provide an option for other people who maybe aren't going to book you to, to, to continue engaging mm -hmm. with you. Um, so, okay, so with all that said, um, I just want to go, before, we're about to answer all of these questions, um, but I do want to say one thing, which is that um, we have a special discount for everyone who is here for our services um, um, at the Void Academy. So we have a membership program essentially um, that basically is our entire online curriculum. It's five courses, um, web presence, newsletters and mailing lists for artists, um, crowdfunding so for artists and ongoing income. So how to make ongoing income um, as a musician mm -hmm. um, through sites like Patreon and through selling your work online. Mm -hmm. Um, we have this full online curriculum. We have ways to sign up for a free 15 minute consults with us every week. We have office hours where we do a live stream like this every week and we help people um, to 
basically tackle their current challenges in their in their in their art practice. Um, and so this membership program that we have, um, if we can switch back just really quickly to the um, the Void Academy website, so we can yes. just show what it looks like. Um, basically, we're offering for Berkeley alums for people who are here. Um, this discount and all you need to do is at the checkout type in the code Berkeley um, and Fritz and, and the staff will send this out also in the summary email so you don't have to worry about scrambling to write it down now but this offer is good through the end of this month and basically you can explore our entire platform um, of these are our these are the courses that we offer here they're all take at your own pace um, and we offer little workbooks and sort of helpful uh, uh, PDFs and ways to improve in each of these areas. Um, as I said, we have our office hours here um, that you can sign up for each week. We have consultations. We have a, a super awesome ebook library. We have partnerships. And so basically, this is our entire platform. This is what we do. This is how we connect with our community. And so we wanted to extend that to you if you want to go any deeper into any of these topics after hearing us teach today. Um, so. And you'll get uh, our email address. I believe Fritz will be sharing it with you. Please email us. Uh, if we don't get to your question, we still want to get to your question, just send us an email. And yeah, we'll, just shoot we'll, us an email we'll, we'll after, chat. afterwards. Um, if you want to just throw up that 30% that off thing in case people do want to write it down now. Um, and the way to do that is to go to voidacademy.com slash membership. And then you check out and you type in the code Berkeley. Um, so now we can get to these questions. I don't know if. Um, Anyone is on hand to help us um, curate the questions, but we're, we're available. That is me. Answer. I'm here. Yeah. Hi, Fritz. Hi, Fritz. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Um, this has been uh, an amazing 45 minutes. I feel like I've learned like 50 different things, and my wife yeah. owns her own business, and I'm going to go home, and I have lots to talk about at the dinner oh, table that's today. Great. I'm so glad. All positive feedback, all incredibly positive feedback. So. Um, there is an incredible number of questions, so I don't know if we're going to be able to get to every single one, but we're going to jump right in. Um, our first question comes from Madison, and her question was, what is the best way to cut through social media noise to reach new listeners? Your that's thoughts on that? That's that is a great, a, a great question. I, I think well, so there are two there are two things that I tend to tell people right off the bat. The first is use <laughs> use social media as a person, right? So uh, actually. Uh, uh, Try and befriend people <laughs> whose work you think is awesome uh, and actually share other work that you think is awesome. That's really the first step because anybody can do it and uh, it is gonna be what defines your aesthetic. So the art that you make is generally speaking uh, defined by your aesthetic, right? So your, what, what you like. And if you start sharing what you like, if you start going out and finding, especially even like obscure folks whose work is really cool but like nobody's seen it yet, like if you can be a tastemaker, in your own, um, within your own niche, then that is probably the, the greatest way to get started doing that that I know of. And I would say to, to piggyback off of that um, for Madison, um, I, I often use the metaphor of thinking of social media, even though it's in a virtual space, thinking of it as a big room mm -hmm. with a lot of people in it. And um, you know, if you walk into a big room and you just start shouting about yourself into this room <laughs> full of people, I think that most people will look at you like, ooh, what's going on here? And they won't necessarily want to engage with yeah. what you're doing. And so we often sort of talk about walking into that room and finding a conversation to join. Mm -hmm. um, you know, listening first, listening to what people are saying on there, you know, listening to how other people are, are you know, what topics are, are happening, engaging with other people, sharing their work, you know, expressing curiosity. Um, I think just sort of using the same etiquette that you would use when walking into a, a group of people and thinking about, you know, providing that opportunity for people to get to know you once you've sort of entered a conversation naturally and shown curiosity and listened as well. Um, and I think making sure that, again, this is cheesy advice, but that you're authentic to yourself and that you're, and that I think people know um, if you're posting because you feel like you have to be posting. And so starting with what is fun for you to post, um, not, you know, starting with something that doesn't make it feel like a chore, um, I think is the key, right? Like I, I deal with a lot of, you know, uh, and consult with a lot of artists who are like, oh, I, I just feel so overwhelmed by social media. I feel like I have to promote this new show. And I'm like, you know, if it's a drag, do it in a way that makes it fun for you or don't do it at all. Totally. You know, it has to feel, um, you have to find a creative way to make it fun for yourself yep. so that it doesn't come across as something really, um, uh, awful. you know, awful <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, I yeah. think that those are the, the sort of, you know, quick piece of advice that we can get on that. 
Awesome. Uh, the next question is, can you talk a little bit more about CTAs and, and a few, you know, can you give a few more examples of CTAs you would put on a website? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so a good CTA is all about <laughs> what you want to do. Like, so what are, what are you offering? Anything that you are offering to humanity uh, can be a CTA. I like to think of it as more of an offer than a request. I think people often think like a CTA is always asking for something. It's really not. Uh, it's almost always kind of a free offer out to the universe uh, to see who's interested. Yeah. Um, so providing an opportunity for someone to engage further. So I think, you know, um, I think, you know, some some classic examples of other CTAs that you might see on websites are, um, you know, come come to my uh, come to my upcoming show. Um, you know, check out this uh, this band camp with my new uh, EP, or mm -hmm. watch this this new music music video that's come out. Um, or I'm know. crowdfunding to do X and X here. Check out my crowdfunding. Check campaign. out my crowdfunding campaign. But with with usually when we say something like that, again, we we recommend that people um, talk about if you're doing a crowdfunding campaign, we recommend that you lead with the, a reward in that campaign again, so mm -hmm. that it feels more like an offering than uh, an ask. Yeah. Um, so really, I think the best CTAs also really. Um, feel like they're giving you something as, um, you know, giving the visitor something, giving the, the audience member something. Um, so it doesn't just feel like you're asking um, with, with no expectation of um, exchange. Mm -hmm. I'll make an offer. If you have a CTA and you don't really know how to craft it, just send us an email and we'll help you. We can help with it, yeah. That's, that's, it, it's a very broad question. It really kind of depends on what we're asking for yeah. as to what the CTA is really going to be most effective at. But that's, yeah, that's good. I, I, I like that as general advice for sure. Yeah. Great, guys. Um, next question, I think this is my favorite question in the group, if I can have one, is my teen daughter says websites are the last place she looks for info on an artist. I saw can that you comment one. a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, your teen daughter is right, and that's true. So, <laughs> no, I'm serious. But, but so given that, why is it important to have a website? Well, uh, there are a couple of reasons. So first of all, if you're looking for any kind of professional contact, uh, if you're looking for not just fandom, but you actually want like, you know, a booking agent to get in contact with you, well, you need a website. It's just sort of a professional courtesy. Uh, it's it's a business card and people expect it. So that's, that's the first answer. Um, the second answer is you don't own Facebook, you don't own Instagram, you can't control any of that. Honestly. And their algorithms are constantly changing. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it used to be the case that you could simply post something to your Facebook page and literally everybody who follows you could read it. That hasn't been true for years. That hasn't been true for, you know, I don't know, six, seven years now. And that is not really true of any social media platform anymore. It's all really down to the algorithm who you're even allowed to talk to who have acknowledged that they want to talk to you. You know what I mean? So um, not only that, but they're constantly in competition. They're constantly adding and removing features. Some of them just disappear outright. Uh, and when that happens, you really don't want to <laughs> be left with no other way to communicate with your audience. Um, yeah. And ultimately, you need to be able to, there, there has to be one place on the internet. The reason that we're so excited about websites and mailing lists, even though they seem like archaic pieces of technology, is kind of because they are archaic pieces of technology. Nobody owns websites. Nobody owns uh, mailing lists. You own that website and you own that mailing list and you can simply take it and move it somewhere else if something weird happens or if the terms of service change in a way that you don't agree with, right? This is especially true of mailing lists uh, and why we really insist that everyone, regardless of how big their social media presence is, also has a mailing list and focuses a lot on that. Um, my, I mean, there, there are more reasons I could go into. You can yeah. craft CTAs specifically on your website, whereas most of the time with something like Facebook, if you're including a CTA, you don't really have that much control over it. And that is such an important part of being able to customize the experience that your fan base has with you as a musician that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I agree with all that. I also think, you know, I, I like to say that you know that, that that doesn't mean that we need to do uh, no social media. I, I recommend right. doing social media, but it also is really important to have a website, a place that you control. And I think maybe the reason why a lot of people don't check websites as the first place is because a lot of websites are simple portfolio sites and yeah. they're not updated a lot. And so that's why we focus on helping musicians to make their websites even better, so that that may be the first place because they're they're more engaging, they're more fun, and they're they're you know, just great sources of information. Yep. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. Like people don't go to websites because websites usually are not great, but also like websites aren't great because people don't really go to websites. So like if you have a great website, it'll stand out and people will go to it. Yeah. Is really the short story. And yeah. it's actually pretty easy because people aren't really thinking about them as much these days. So yeah. And I think the last thing I'll say to that, sorry to you know keep going, but um, the 
you know, we we often you talk about this pathway where we ha we like it when artists use social media, right? And then they send people from their social media to the website and then onto the mailing list. Um, I think that's a really good pathway to get people closer and closer and more involved, as well as um, you know, you then own, as, as Noah said, you really have, you have that list of email addresses um, that mm -hmm. is not touchable by any kind of algorithm. Um, and um, they're yours rather than social media followers, which, you, you know, we don't know about those platforms and how they may change in the future and what algorithms they're using. Awesome. Well, I'm noticing the time. It is over two o'clock. Um, we do still have a, a long list of questions. So what I'm going to say to that is um, we will be sending out a copy of this webinar and uh, both Sienna and Noah's contact information. That webinar uh, audio file will be going out uh, this Friday afternoon after 3 p.m. So keep an eye out for that, um, as well as their contact information, as well as a copy of the discount code um, for Void Academy if our if our listeners choose to use that. Um, I want to thank Sienna and Noah for an amazing presentation um, this afternoon. Thank you both. Um, I also want to thank <clears throat> uh, Max and Michael for contributing their websites for review. Um, some One of the toughest things I think around in the Berkeley alumni community is, uh, of course, uh, having to put yourself on show in front of your peers. So um, a shout out to Max and Michael. Um, wherever they are, I know that one of them is, is currently on a plane as we speak. So. Um, and they were both Don't, great websites, so we were very, we were very impressed by both of them. <laughs> yeah. Just if, if that wasn't clear, we, that we were like, wow, these are really two wonderful examples. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I also want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, please, please be sure to visit us um, and visit uh, berkeley.edu slash alumni. Again, I've learned a lot today, so don't be surprised if our website changes over the next couple of months. <laughs> um, but follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Um, and also, one last shout out is, of course, uh, this is our last webinar for 2019. We will be back in February uh, with a webinar around investing for for the artist's future. But in the meantime, in between that, we have a list of alumni holiday parties uh, that are taking place around the world. Uh, this list is updated almost daily, so we mo are most likely to have a lot more locations um, over the next two to three weeks. So keep an eye out for that. If you are in one of these locations and interested in joining us, it's a great place to network. It's a great place to catch your friends. Um, and of course, uh, December is a, a sort of that, that holiday season, so it's a great way to reconnect with um, friends and family from the Berkeley community. So with that, my name is Fritz Kuhnlens, and this has been our alumni webinar series, and we hope you have a great day. Take care. Take care, and thanks, everyone.